Daniel's here. He is an Agile coach. He is a trainer. He has produced a workshop. He's going to talk about that tonight. Uh, I can't think of anything else to, it, <laughs> to say, but I'm going to pass the proverbial microphone over to him to finish off the introduction. And I'd like everybody to please give him a warm welcome. Cool, thank you. Yeah, as Roy said, I'm, I'm currently working as an Agile coach, um, but over the last sort of 11, 12, maybe even 13 years, I've been working in the Agile space. I've been a product owner. I've been a scrum master, so I've sort of done most things. Um, albeit I've took a very different route into an Agile way of working. My degree is in criminology and social policy. Um, my first sort of real job was as a civilian in the police force where I was a crime analyst. I worked on murder inquiries, double murder inquiries, kidnap cases, something very, very different from Agile. But I got to a point in my career where I couldn't go any further unless my boss left. Uh, and I ended up moving into the NHS and I was doing analysis of healthcare data. And one of the publications that I was uh, working on, the processing that data needs to be brought in house, I got to be the product owner on that. And after that, I was hooked. At the end of 18 months of, of delivery, I didn't want to go back to doing data analysis and publications. I wanted to do this agile thing because I really enjoyed it. There were no sort of roles as a product owner, so I became a scrum master. Did that for a year sort of within the NHS before moving on to Equifax and Skybet, where I was made redundant. So I was able to go contracting and then sort of worked with uh, sort of Lloyds Banking Group, Vodafone, DHL, uh, University of Leeds. Um, as sort of scrum master or agile coach. And it's that last sort of six or seven years where I've been sort of undertaking that sort of more of a coaching role. And that's where this sort of talk came from, is that during that we go through lots of change. And while we're undertaking that change, change affects the individuals that are being a part of that change, that that change might be happening to or they're part of. So I've, I came up with um, an interactive workshop. Unfortunately, you've not got that interactive element today. You've got, there'll be a bit of participation, but it's mainly me, me speaking, um, that I'll be presenting at Agile 2024 in Manchester um, in July. So this is partly to help sort of practice some of the non-interactive bits, but we'll, we'll get there. So that's sort of setting the scene um, for what to expect today, that we are going to uh, go through some of those things. Um, it is a bit of an appetizer. I'm hoping that we will get that interactive element at a future Agile Yorkshire session. So we'll, we'll sort of watch this space on there. Um, so I'm going to be looking at some of the problems, some of the anti-patterns associated with change. And I say how it makes individuals feel, because sometimes that can be forgotten. What's the impact of that change at an individual level? So I thought I'd start by looking at what changes in the dictionary. Lots of these talks sort of do that. They go back and say, right, what is uh, the problem? And, and change refers to the process of something becoming different from its original state. Now, this could be a really broad spectrum of things. It could be sort of some subtle adjustments to significant overhauls in the ways of working. And it could be physical, it could be emotional, it could be social, it could be environmental. Um, and it can occur over multiple time frames. Well, some of these things could be instantaneous changes and some could be gradual evolutions. But change at its core involves moving away from the status quo, altering those existing conditions, altering the characteristics and behaviours to create a new reality, a new way of doing things. And that concept of change is fundamental in understanding the sort of progress and adaptation. And we always look at sort of that um, inspection, adaptation and transparency within that agile world, particularly within Scrum. And we live in a constantly evolving world. So the ability to adapt and change is crucial to our survival and our success. And it's through change that innovation is achieved, allowing for the development of new ideas solutions and improvements. Now, while change can be perceived as disruptive and unsettling, 
it's also essential. Uh, we need it for growth, we need it for development, we need to enable individuals and systems to evolve and thrive in dynamic environments. So here's that audience participation there. So uh, I'm hoping I've picked a question that given we're at an Agile meetup, I'm gonna get a lot of hands raised. So who has been involved in an Agile transformation? So pretty much most hands have gone up there, good. Okay, well, I've got a second question for you. Who's been involved in an Agile transformation? <laughs> laughs, some quizzical looks. So, okay, there's a reason I've, I've asked this. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what's the difference between an uppercase agile transformation and a lowercase agile transformation? So from the perspective of the individual involved, a capital A, capital T agile transformation infers involuntary mandatory change. The capital A identifies how you are going to change. You will be agile. There will be a product owner. There will be a scrum master. We'll have team members. You're going to have stand-ups. You're going to have retrospectives. There'll be user stories. You use story points, planning poker, velocity, burn down charts. You will have those things. The capital T tells individuals, you will transform. It represents a program of work with a start date, an end date where you will have that transformation completed. It's a top-down mandate. It's treated like a project with big upfront planning and an 18-month deadline. An agile transformation is a revolution in the way that you are working. However, a lowercase a lowercase t agile transformation has a completely different feel. Agility becomes emergent. The lowercase a allows teams to apply an agile mindset, to try agile practices, to identify what works best for them. The lowercase t targets continuous improvement. It considers where you are now, monitoring what you, uh, while you experiment and reviewing where you get to. At the review, you consider, like, are there still improvements we can make? Should we continue what we're doing? Have we improved as much as we can on this small experiment? Should we stop and do something else? Actually, if we made things worse, should we go back to what we were doing before and work out what to do next? And those last two allow for that experimentation to continue for the teams to pivot. It becomes an evolution. So based upon those definitions, and I think I know because we didn't have many lowercase a's, who's been involved in an agile transformation with capital A, capital T? Has anybody experienced the lowercase? Ah, oh, a few more hands this time, now we're giving you the, the definition. Have they felt different? Nods. So I've got a quote from Martin Fowler, who is one of the Agile Manifesto signatories. And where transformation has changed are a mandated program. It used that old way of thinking to, imply, to, uh, to a new, it applies it to a new way of working. It doesn't apply an Agile mindset to agility. He said, imposing Agile methods introduces a conflict with the values and principles that underlie Agile methods. Now this conflict, it generates sort of a, a number of emotional reactions. Now, one of those emotional reactions is fear and resistance. Now it's not surprising that a mandated change will trigger fear and resistance among employees and individuals. There are worries about a loss of control. There's uncertainty. There's fear of failure, fear of incompetence. They might get additional work and potentially they might get, have change fatigue if this is not the first agile transformation that they've been through. Managers or leaders of sort of siloed based teams, they might feel threatened, fearing for the empire that they've built and what it means for them. Now, depending upon the messaging of sort of why that change or transformation is occurring and depending upon how that change is approached, 
change can drive a fear for survival and that leads to resistance. There can, that resistance can lead to loss aversion. And there's a tendency for individuals to prefer avoiding losses compared to acquiring gains of a similar or better value. Now, studies have suggested that losses are twice as powerful psychologically than gains. People fear, and this loss or the fear of loss may be an evolutionary hangover. If we go back, those on the edge of survival, the loss of a day's food uh, could be enough to cause starvation. But the gain of additional food, although it'd be nice, they've already survived. And you've got a new problem. What do you do with that food? How do we store it and how do we protect it? Now this evolutionary tendency to avoid losses, even to obtain gains, cements and hardens an individual's desire to maintain the status quo. Now, another reaction is an agentic state. And an agentic state is a mindset which allows us to carry out orders from an authority figure, even if they conflict with our own personal sense of right and wrong. Now, forcing that change on individuals creates that extrinsic rather than an intrinsic motivator. And this leads to that state where people feel compelled to obey those orders, even if they don't believe in them. In this scenario, sort of people just, they want the change to fail. And so they'll sabotage it by sort of working to the letter of the law to do exactly what they're being told to do. If there's a lack of psychological safety from that command and control culture, individuals become frozen through that learned helplessness they do. Then they wait to be told what to do rather than thinking for themselves. And change can also remove some of the motivators, some of the things that motivate us, that autonomy, that mastery and purpose. When individuals hear that they are undergoing that agile transformation with a capital A and a capital T, at least two of those motivators are taken away. There's a lack of autonomy. You have to do this. You have no choice. There's that lack of mastery. You go back to the beginning again. We've got this new way of working that everybody has to learn. Now, they might also lose purpose uh, if the why we're changing is poorly articulated. Ah, oh, this is a cost reduction exercise. We want to increase our profits so our shareholders get a bigger dividend. Neither of those things are valuable to the employee as to sort of what they're going to go through. Now, these human reactions to change and the emotions that may manifest can be represented through the five stages of grief in the Kubler-Ross curve. So I'm sure you've all seen this curve before. We've got the five stages there. We've got shock and denial comes first, uh, then anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Now, it's obviously important to note that although this curve does follow a path, and it's a path that most people will follow when they go through the five stages of grief, you don't have to go through them in this order. You might not go through some at all. You might come back and revisit different stages at different times as well. But in general, they will follow this order. And that first stage is shock and denial. And it's generally the, the shortest one as well. And that shock of the change being announced um, actually sometimes gets that little rise in morale. It just, the curve does go up a little bit where there's an initial excitement um, as to the change that might be taking place because there's that increased engagement within an organisation and we're finding out more about what's going on. But the hard work is yet to come. Individuals faced with the uh, prospect of forced change may find that their sort of job or status or competence is currently on the line uh, and they find it difficult to absorb that news. What has got them to that point, all of their hard work may no longer continue to move them forward. The way that they're working might not move them forward anymore. And that starts to bring in denial. Ah, oh, this is just another transformation program. It happens every two or three years. I've avoided the previous ones. This change is way off and nothing's happened to me yet. Now for some that may bring about some sort of cynicism and they sort of put their head in the sand, continuing as they were, persevering uh, and pretending that everything will be the same. 
Now, as everybody sort of starts to see that this change isn't going away, and it's, the situation is real, some people may start to get a little bit angry. They start to blame the company, blame the change agents, blame the leaders. They blame sort of the new technology that's coming along, the people that they think have all the solutions. Surely this is just a fad. And as that frustration goes, people become irritable. Morale drops. And as we can see, the curve starts to come down. And anger is that indication that the change is being acknowledged rather than denied. Now, individuals facing sort of this inflicted change may sort of start to bargain with those around them. Uh, your, your ideas are fine. Yeah, we're happy with that. But we're special. We're an edge case. Sort of we, we don't work in that way. And they'll try to hold on to as much of their way as working as they can in exchange for, oh, well, we can do this bit, that fits in, we'll do this small element of change. Now, this stage of bargaining is a further step in that mental acceptance that change is coming, that and individuals are looking to figure out how to minimise that change rather than deny it or fight it. Now, individuals will sort of start to begin to acknowledge the fact that change is inevitable. It's going to happen and it's going to affect them. And there's nothing I can do to prevent that. This means we move into sort of this area of depression where sort of some people sort of stop caring. There's no point in being enthusiastic or making any plans for the future. Now, this is the stage where sort of that unlearning and learning is going to be felt most. Vulnerability increases. Individuals become learners again. They have to start learning a new way of doing things, starting to rebuild that mastery that they once had. At this point, without support and coaching, this is where some teams and organisations may start to give up. But hopefully they don't. And we can sort of move on to acceptance. And by experimenting with better ways of working, empowerment, support, coaching, and starting to see the beginning of better outcomes, individuals begin to move from depression into acceptance. And as I mentioned, not everyone is gonna go through this in a linear fashion. The peaks and troughs could be completely different for different individuals, for different teams, for different departments, and people may move back through this multiple times. So what can we look to do? First one is we can sort of try to focus on some of the outcomes. It's important to remember that implementing an Agile framework, an Agile methodology, that is not the goal. It should support a wider objective. If we can start with why we're doing this, what's the purpose behind it, and articulate the outcomes that we want to achieve, they should be the focal point for the, those first initial and ongoing communications. As teams start to experiment with that agile mindset and agile practices in order to achieve those outcomes, we can find that sort of some teams and individuals are already working in that way. They're already using that new approach because they're those innovators. They're happily going to get on the bus and go on the journey with you. Those innovators are likely to be followed quickly by early adopters who are excited and enthusiastic about the journey but it's at this point that you need to cross the chasm. To get that early majority on board, you need to demonstrate practical value and reliability, showcasing proven success stories, providing robust support and tailoring the products and services to meet the specific needs and concerns of that early majority. This is gonna build trust and reduce those perceived risks that they may have. We've then got that late majority, those people that are gonna to follow towards the end. But they're gonna follow as soon as they see that early majority are on board. That widespread acceptance, those tangible benefits um, are gonna come along. That late majority, they're more cautious, they're more risk averse. So the endorsement of as many people as you can is gonna help them get on board and go that journey. Now the laggards right at the end who are the most resistant to change, will, event will eventually adopt that new innovation primarily out of necessity, because they're the last ones to do it. Either that or they'll end up leaving. Now, throughout this, communication 
is key to ensuring that the overall outcome that wants to be achieved, the communication approach and language will need to evolve in relation to those groups of people that you're trying to get on board. It will be different each time. Now, when changes are introduced in that big bang manner, we've sort of seen that Kubler-Ross curve. There's that initial excitement followed by that depression when reality hits. Now, the bigger the change, the bigger the dip and the longer it's going to last. So for large organisations doing a capital A, capital T agile transformation, this could last in the region of sort of two to three years. So what we want to do, is obviously, again, as we noted, that that dip at that lowest point is when some organisations and teams give up and there's that new transformation programme and you'll then get another dip that will follow. So to combat this, we want to have those smaller, safe to fail experiments that reduce the length of time ago, reduce the impact on everybody, and we can learn from them quickly. What small experiment could you run to improve the situation? Once we've solved that, what's the next experiment we can run? This minimizes disruption, that initial decline, reduces the impact, increases the speed of recovery, gives you that success story. It helps you improve beyond that initial level faster, generating the evidence that you need to entice that early and late majority. Now outcomes are not just an IT responsibility, they're a whole organisation responsibility. Delivering value to customers sooner and with higher quality needs more than just an IT department. But this is often where the adoption of Agile starts and ends. Adopting agility across an entire organisational system fosters cohesion, adaptiveness, resilience. It means that you can respond swiftly to market changes and customer needs. Now, when those Agile principles permeate all departments, from marketing to finance to HR, that organisation benefits from that enhanced collaboration that unified approach to problem solving. It breaks down silos, encourages cross-functional teams, promotes a culture of continuous improvement and innovation. We can align all parts of the company. We can deliver greater value to our customers, achieve strategic goals more effectively, maintain that competitive edge in an ever-changing business landscape. Now, there's no one size fits all. There's no agile in a box cookie cutter that optimizes outcomes in all contexts. Your organization, your customers, your environment you work in, your processes, your systems of work, your history, your team, you are all unique. Organizations are complex adaptive systems. Small things in a complex system may have no effect. They might have a massive one. So we shouldn't dogmatically inflict standardized processes and practices. Inflicting the same approach on every team is an anti-pattern and may cause more harm than good, both to productivity and to morale. Instead, we need to conduct those small safe-to-fail experiments that are key to learning, key to continuous improvement. Achieve big through small. So this is an overview of those four things. So we're given a snapshot of the problem of change how it affects individuals. And these are the takeaways I want to leave you, that we, if we focus on these things, it could help minimise the impact that they feel. But hopefully, this is just the beginning of the change journey we're gonna go on together. So we are looking to try and work out how to run that interactive workshop where you can come along and you could be able to experience the feelings of change through the medium of Lego. So there's lots of smiles. People are interested, Roy. They want to come along. Yeah. Yeah. We'll explore change further in that and we'll delve into the models that, that you can actually use to support effective change initiatives. Fantastic. Thank you.